Now the colon wall is going to be a little bit inflamed at that same area. And so what can end up happening is we have a little bit of gravity from these gallstones. These gallstones can form a fistula and cross into the transverse colon. Okay, so these gallstones are now directly falling into the colon and they're going to be uh, leaving through the stool. Okay, so this patient that has that fistula is not going to have really any symptoms. They're going to be pooping out gallstones left and right, but because uh, you know, we don't have sensations here. Uh, this fistula is really going to be kind of asymptomatic. This patient is just going to be pooping out gallstones all the time. Now, there's another organ that the, gall, that the gallbladder is nearby. Um, I wish I had an eraser so I could make a little bit more space here. Um, so, here's our gallbladder. We said that it's nearby, <coughs> excuse me, it's nearby the transverse colon. The other organ that is nearby is our duodenum. Okay, so here's our here's our stomach. Here's the first part of our duodenum coming around. Here's the ampulla here. Okay, so if we have a bunch of stones here, we can have the same thing happen where we have a little bit of inflammation. That inflammation gets transmitted over to the duodenum, and we end up getting stones in our duodenum. Now we have a bigger problem though, because as these stones pass through our GI tract, they're ultimately going to get to the terminal ileum. The terminal ileum is a valve, and a very small valve at that. So when we get all the way down to the terminal ileum, I'm just going to use this diagram to sort of show, as we get down to the terminal ileum, we can get an obstruction. These gallstones can become lodged here at the terminal ileum and end up ca causing an ileus, an obstructive ileus, because now no stool can pass through uh, into the colon. Okay. So two ways to get fistulas from a gallbladder. Number one, you can have a fistula between the gallbladder and the colon, in which case your patient's going to be asymptomatic. They're just going to be pooping out gallstones all the time. They're not going to know it. The second way is a fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum, in which case the stones will progress through the entire GI tract and get lodged at the terminal ileum, okay, ileocecal valve. They're going to get lodged. Your patient's going to present with obstruction. The USMLE wants you to know these two ways to get a fistula and especially the way to get an obstruction. Okay, So here, gallstone ileus, gallstones obstructing the lumen of the small bowel. Uh, this is going to be due to uh, that fistula at the area of the duodenum. Okay, Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Excellent. 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 Anything else I want to say on that? Oh yeah, so the way that I always remember this is that it's fun to poop, okay? So if you have a, um, if you have stones that are passing into your colon and you're pooping them out, it's fun. You don't have any symptoms, it's great, you're just pooping stones. Versus uh, when you have that uh, fistula between the duodenum and the gallbladder, that's not so fun, okay? So fun to poop, it's fun to poop these out when you have that, uh, you know, colonic, um, I don't know what the name for this fistula is, but between the gallbladder and the colon. Okay. Great. So, and uh, we talked about our acute cholecystitis a little bit. So just a sort of quick, quickly adding on a little bit information. There may or may not be bacterial growth with that acute cholecystitis. Uh, different from appendicitis, where you get obstruction along bacteria, you get neutrophils, whatever, whatever. Here, we more just have that inflammation, right? That gallbladder has been uh, pushing against that stone so much that it just kind of gets irritated and it ends up getting inflamed, leading to acute cholecystitis. Uh, we'll have an enlarged gallbladder. Uh, you can have a gangrenous cholecystitis where you actually have necrosis or death of the wall. And uh, when you go in to take this gallbladder out, it's going to be black. And you can ha actually have an acalculus cholecystitis where you have an ischemic gallbladder. You, you don't have any stone at all, but because you have uh, some problem with uh, coronary artery disease, uh, peripheral vascular disease, um, uh, atherosclerosis, this ends up causing ischemia to the gallbladder. Okay, so look for a patient with serious illness, sepsis, burns, okay, all that good stuff. How do patients present? This is what we want to look for. Steady or colicky, meaning coming and going, right upper abdominal pain. Right upper abdominal pain. That's typical. And this pain will radiate to the tip of the right scapula or shoulder, and these patients will be intolerant to fatty food because the gallbladder can
cannot emulsify those fatty foods. We can look for a Murphy sign or pain on inspiration and our classical cardinal signs of inflammation are fever, nausea, leukocytosis. Left shift means lots of neutrophils. Okay? Whenever you see this term left shift, they're saying there's elevated neutrophils. Recurrent attacks can lead to a chronic cholecystitis and uh, complications. We can get bacterial growth with pus in the gallbladder leading to peritonitis and we need to do a cholecystectomy which we can actually do laparoscopically very easily. Okay. Bread and butter surgery for surgeons. If we do not take out the gallbladder, sometimes patients, they have this, these attacks again and again and again, and they just don't come in. They say, you know, I'm, I'm really strong. You know, I don't really feel pain like other people. I'm not gonna go in. Okay, great. So now you're getting chronic cholecystitis. So here you can see this, the wall of this gallbladder is so thick the size of these gallstones is absolutely huge, and this is our chronic cholecystitis. Uh, repeated bouts of acute cholecystitis. Uh, we're looking for a very thick wall fibrosis sludge. Uh, and on histopathology, we can look for this very specific thing called a Rokitansky Ashoff sinus. And that's what we see in this image here is this Rokitansky Ashoff sinus with uh, mucosa that invaginates into the muscular layer, making a sinus. Uh, this will eventually calcify. You can see a gallbladder on, on x-ray called a porcelain gallbladder. Okay, It's just going to look like a bright white gallbladder on x-ray because of all the calcium there. Okay, If you do develop this porcelain gallbladder, guess what? Now you have an increased incidence of carcinoma of the gallbladder. Okay, So if you weren't ready to have that taken out now, yet now you 100% need to do it. Okay, So if we see a painless palpable gallbladder, think about carcinoma either of the gallbladder or of the pancreas. Uh, and this, these patients typically present in the seventh decade. Acute pancreatitis is a uh, most common cause in females. It's going to be gallstones. For men, it's alcoholism. How do these patients present? We have this acute onset of mid, uh, mild to severe epigastric abdominal pain that radiates to the back. This pain is from necrosis and inflammation. Uh, when we do our blood tests, we can look for elevated amylase, elevated lipase, and uh, these are going to be threefold increased. Okay, elevated amylase, elevated lipase. Ultimately, pancreatitis is going to be a clinical diagnosis, so these help you in your diagnosis, but you can actually diagnose it without these levels. Uh, look for hypocalcemia. Why hypo hypocalcemia? Pancreas is a very fatty organ. Okay, and so when we have inflammation of fat. What do we get? Saponification. Okay, any inflammation of fat is going to lead to saponification. Saponification, which is calcium deposits in fat. Anytime you have inflammation of fat, you will see calcium deposits. Because you're getting those calcium deposits on the fat, the calcium level in the blood is going to drop, giving you that hypocalcemia. Hyperglycemia, due to destruction of those beta cells, you cannot regulate your. Uh, glucose levels without insulin and if you have a stone in your common bile duct you may even see jaundice okay great so pathogenesis we talked about this a few times but that uh, that abnormal activation of trypsin it should not be activated while still within the lumen of the uh, pancreatic ducts and so if you activate it early it's going to start digesting the pancreas itself uh, this leads to a center cell injury um, and you know you end up having you know kinin causing vasodilation, some clotting which can lead to DIC, complement leading to shock from our anaphylatoxin C5A, C3A. Uh, this influx of calcium again, our saponification, trauma, medications, infections, and metabolic disorders are all causes of pancreatitis. Uh, complications can be pretty bad. So DIC from widespread clotting, shock and ARDS. We really want to keep an eye on our pancreatic, uh, our pancreatitis patients. These patients need to be admitted to the hospital. Okay. And so uh, when we talk about our causes of pancreatitis, you know, obviously you want to know alcoholism, you want to know gallstones. There's a lot of other uh, causes. Hypercalcemia is a cause of acute pancreatitis. Hyperlipidemia is a cause of acute pancreatitis. There's a long list of different things. Uh, so just be familiar with, uh, the list is in first aid. Uh, so when you check your first aid book, 
uh, review that list and um, make sure you can explain why each one does that, okay? It's not immediately obvious, especially with hypercalcemia and hyperlipidemia, why those two would lead to pancreatitis, but uh, just review that and sort of be comfortable with it if you see it on a question stem. Okay, and so here's our causes actually. I left them in here, great. So idiopathic uh, gallstones, right? An obstruction of the ampulla can lead to acute pancreatitis. Ethanol, aka alcohol, trauma. Our patient is in a car accident. The steering wheel um, traumatically hits their abdomen, causing a blunt force trauma to the pancreas itself. A patient's on steroids. Mumps is one of the one of the two places mumps goes to infect are the pancreas. The other one is the testicles. Okay, pancreas and testicles are the two places. Okay, pancreas, testicles, and salivary glands. Actually, those three. Pancreas testicle salivary glands are all are places that mumps likes to cause an infection. Uh, autoimmune diseases, scorpion sting, super random, hypercalcemia, hypertriglyceridemia, and ERCP. ERCP is where we um, stick a tube down our patient's uh, esophagus. So it, essentially what ERCP is, is when you do an upper endoscopy. Um, when you do an upper endoscopy, you have a little tube with a camera on the end of it, okay? And that camera is connected to a television so you can look at what is in the stomach, what's in the esophagus, and what's in the duodenum. The nice thing about this tube with the camera on it is there's actually a area where we can add tools, okay? And so one of the tools we can add is um, a catheter to inject dye. So with ERCP, what we can do is we can inject dye into the ampulla and that can tell us if there's any stones within the common bile duct, okay? That's how the ERCP works. We inject dye into this ampulla, and then we take a quick x-ray, and we look and see if this dye is surrounding any of these gallstones, okay? That's ERCP. The problem is that when we inject dye into the ampulla, the dye is also going to go with into, the, into the pancreas, okay? And sometimes this dye can cause inflammation in the pancreas and ultimately lead to pancreatitis, okay? So that's our ERCP. Uh, some sulfa drugs, NRTIs, which are the drugs for HIV AIDS. Protease inhibitors, again, for HIV AIDS can lead to this. How do we diagnose acute pancreatitis? I told you it is a clinical diagnosis. So we have two out of three criteria. Acute epigastric pain rating to the back. Elevated amylase or lipase, three times the limit of normal. And, or characteristic imaging findings, okay? We have very very low threshold for diagnosing acute pancreatitis. These things are pretty general, right? Epigastric pain rating to the back, that's not something that's super specific, uh, but that is gonna be specific for acute pancreatitis, so it's a pretty easy diagnosis to make. All right, and so when we talk about imaging findings, this is a CT scan. There will be CT scans on your uh, step one, just to sort of uh, give you a, a warning. Don't shoot the messenger, but you are gonna see stuff like this. So. Here's our normal uh, CT scan of the abdomen, probably at about the level of, uh, I would say, L1, L2, because I see the renal artery coming off here. Um, uh, here's maybe the SMA coming off. This is probably the renal vein, actually, now that I think about it. But anyway, um, so at about this point, you can see here is our pancreas. Here's our pancreatic artery. Um, here is, what is this big old organ right here, Eva? Liver. Liver, good. How about over here? Also spleen. Spleen, <laughs> good. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I know you, I know you know how to read these. Um, so now when we look on our pancreatitis, what we can see is at this, about the same level, you can see that the pancreas itself, the borders of the pancreas are not as well defined. You can see on this image, I kind of wrote over the borders, unfortunately, but you can see that the borders are nicely, nicely defined. There's a nice demarcation between what is pancreas and what is not pancreas. Now, when we look at our pancreatitis, all that inflammation is sort of like blurring that border. In addition, you see all of this something called fat stranding. These are just like strands of inflammatory fat that are reaching out and touching other organs. Okay, so that is our pancreatitis on CT. Uh, I wouldn't expect them to. I wouldn't expect them to expect you to diagnose pancreatitis solely off a CT scan. That's not how we do it in, in practice anyway. Uh, so there should be some clinical picture 
hinting you towards pancreatitis. Okay. Great. So chronic pancreatitis here, we're looking for a middle-aged alcoholic male, uh, repeated bouts of pancreatic inflammation. And so this patient is going to end up with loss of the functions of the pancreas, meaning we're going to have malabsorption, pancreatic insufficiency with you know, that fatty diarrhea, loss of fat-soluble vitamins, and we'll also have some diabetes because of that loss of the endocrine functions and mild increase in serum amylase during those attacks. It may lead to a pseudocyst. What is a pseudocyst? They love asking about pseudocysts. I'm not particularly sure why, because I haven't seen a ton of them in, um, in my experience. Maybe your experience was different. But uh, essentially, when you have repeated bouts of acute inflammation, here's our pancreas. When you have a repeated bouts, some of the part of the pancreas can uh, end up leaving a bunch of inflammatory material, forming a pseudocyst. It is not a true cyst because it's not pancreatic tissue. What's the cystic space is a wall of just fibrosis. This is just a fibrous layer forming the outside of the cyst. And inside of that cyst, we'll see blood and necrotic tissue. We do not see epithelial tissue. This is what I mean by a pseudo cyst. This is not pancreatic tissue making up the wall of the cyst. Okay. Uh, this can be caused by acute chronic pancreatitis, trauma, um, and yeah, it may present as an abdominal mass because of the fluid, but a lot of times these are going to be asymptomatic, and um, we're not going to treat these a lot of the time. Okay. Carcinoma of the pancreas, pancreatic cancer, very, very big right now in terms of research, and uh, you know, it's very scary. You know, this, typically these are asymptomatic, so we're looking for a little bit older patients, although you know, patients as young as 50 can show up with these. Um, it arises from a well-defined non-invasive precursor lesions uh, in the small ducts of the pancreas. Okay? The risks here, cigarette smoking, high-fat diets, uh, diabetes, chronic pancreatitis, but cigarette smoking is going to be the number one that you need to know for your exam and the one that they expect you to know. There's a ton of questions on the, on the USMLE Step 1 about risk factors for different diseases. Yes. It's true, unfortunately, you need to know risk factors, okay? So be sure that as we go through this and as you do your own studying, you are committing these to memory. Uh, these are typically gonna remain silent unless there's some impingement on the adjacent structures. So uh, for, in the example of the head of the pancreas, think about what might happen if we have, so here's the lumen of our duodenum, here's the ampulla, uh, here's our pancreas, here's our common bile duct coming here to the ampulla, and here's our pancreatic ducts coming to the ampulla, and they're all supposed to be draining into the duodenum. So let's think about what would happen if we had a giant tumor growing in this area, right? We're going to end up having an obstruction of the cystic duct, and we're going to have an obstruction of the pancreatic duct. So what's that going to look like? We're going to have an obstructive jaundice with dark urine, light stool, um, and uh, we we'll also have you know, all those pancreatic enzymes that are not making it into the duodenum. And so we're going to have some steatorrhea, uh, vitamin malabsorption, and things we're used to with that idea. Okay. So if your patient is lucky, they will have this kind where we see it, we can treat it, uh, cut it out, and hopefully give this patient some semblance of a normal life. If they have a lesion in the body or tail, of the pancreas. This is very, very bad because we're not going to see it. If it's in the body or the tail, it's not obstructing anything. It's just sitting here and growing. This is kind of like our uh, right-sided cancers where they're just growing and growing and growing and our patient has no idea, right? This is behind, this is behind the, uh, it's retroperitoneal. And so there's no sensations there, okay? Uh, it's very bad prognosis. One thing we can look for is a distended, non-palpable gallbladder, um, meaning that our gallbladder has become distended, but it's not painful. Um, and uh, the reason for that is it's just been distended for so long. Okay. Trousseau sign, they add this into question stems quite a bit, actually. Uh, so this is a migratory thrombophlebitis, inflammation of a vein due to a blood clot seen in about 10% of patients. Okay, so this type of patient will come to the ER because all of a sudden they have a, um, a very dark leg, 
right? They've had a thrombus in the, one of their deep veins of their leg, and now their whole leg is turning dark colored. Um, they are having a lot of pain there, um, and then it resolves. And a week after that, it happens in their arm, okay? And then they have some superficial thrombus in, this, in their skin. And then they have a thrombus in their renal vein. They, have these, they keep having these thrombi all through their body. They're almost hypercoagulable. It's considered migratory, right, like a bird. And this is considered Trousseau's sign. Trousseau's sign. And it's just um, a lot of thrombi throughout the body. CDKN2A mutation is one of the mutations that's really strongly associated with carcinoma of the pancreas. But memorize these ones, 2KRAS and TP3. Okay? Put in a bunch of stars. I want you to know these mutations. Okay? And so just sort of uh, comparing and contrasting all three of these together, I made a handy little slide for you all to review. Okay, so uh, for our liver, we have, uh, you know, an inflammation of our liver we consider hepatitis. This can be due to, you know, autoimmune hepatitis, drug-induced hepatitis, organisms can cause hepatitis, alcohol, I guess, falls under drugs, but a lot of different ways to have that inflammation of our uh of our liver. Uh, our liver may have some degeneration uh, with some ballooning seen on histology, a uh, foamy due to cholestasis or steatosis, fatty change of the liver. Um, the USMLE wants you to know this difference between microvesicular fatty change and macrovesicular fatty change. This is just one of those memorization kind of things, unfortunately. So, fatty change you can see in Ray's syndrome. You can also see it in alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In Ray syndrome, it's microvesicular. And alcoholic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's macrovesicular. Big, big globules of fat, okay? So you can, I mean, one way you can remember it is that Ray syndrome primarily occurs in children, right? So you can think of children are small, that's a microvesicular, versus macrovesicular alcoholics, maybe a little bit on the heavier side, you know, maybe our beer drinkers a little bit heavier non-alcoholic fatty liver disease happens in more obese patients, so that would be a macro vesicular fatty change, okay? All right, so uh, seeing fibrosis in our liver, what we look for is bridging of the portal tracts with fibrotic material, okay? And uh, Toby, I see that uh, you are able to join us. Happy to see you. Um, I'm sorry that uh, we had to start early today, but I wanted to let you know that um, that I did record this lecture for you, and I'll be making it available for you after we finish, okay? It's, it's currently recording now. Let me make sure it's still going. Just a minute. Yeah, it's still recording. So you'll be able to get this, the full lecture after we finish, okay, to give you anything. I, I changed it on such short notice, I really felt bad, so uh, I wanted to record it for you. Uh, with cirrhosis of the liver, what we see is this diffuse fibrous tissue with regenerative nodule of hepatocytes. We're going to look at what that looks like. It's a very, uh, very uh, particular way that it looks. Essentially, you have bits of hepatocytes that are trying to generate the normal, the normal architecture of the liver, but they're not able to do so due to all of that fibrous tissue around. Okay, So they end up making these ballooning nodules of hepatocytes that look kind of bizarre. We'll look at what that looks like. Whenever we have hepatic injury, we will see elevations of ALT. We will see elevations of AST. The ratio of those elevations can give us a clue as to what caused the inflammation in the first place. So, for example, when you have patients that have alcoholic damage to their liver, you tend to see more increases in your AST relative to ALT. And so we'll talk about different ways we can kind of get to our diagnosis looking at ALT and AST. Okay, first we need to talk about our congenital syndromes. So I love this diagram from our uh, first aid book showing us all of our hereditary hyperbilirubinemias. These are all going to be autosomal recessive uh, diagnoses. So the first we can talk about is our Gilbert syndrome. Here we have mildly decreased UDP leucuronosyl transferase conjugation. Remember I told you that this UDP transferase 
enzyme was going to be really important. I wanted you to memorize this enzyme because it keeps coming back again and again. Uh, very important for conjugating bilirubin. What we see in this disorder is an asymptomatic or mild jaundice. This is not a sick, sick patient. We have increased unconjugated bilirubin. Why? They can't conjugate. They have low levels of the enzyme without overt hemolysis. Okay. The times we may see elevated bilirubin is going to be fasting and stress. This is very common. We do not see clinical consequences. Okay. krigler najjar syndrome. Now, to me, this sounds like the bad guy in one of the James Bond movies. You know, krigler najjar You know, he's the one, you know, with the super laser that's going to, um, you know, heat up the ocean and uh, kill all the fish. So, uh, krigler najjar this is our very bad guy. And so this must be a very bad disease. Here we have an absent UDP glucuronosyl transferase. Our absent UDP transferase means we cannot conjugate bilirubin at all. Okay, now we talked about how you can have a direct bilirubin and an indirect bilirubin. Okay, direct bilirubin we like. Direct bilirubin is water soluble. It's conjugated to that uh, glucuronide molecule. It can be excreted in the bile. It can go out through the urine. This is a very friendly type of bilirubin. Indirect bilirubin is not friendly at all. It tends to precipitate. It's very um, active in terms of its charge. It can cause damage to some of our cells. And so indirect bilirubin, we do not like having around. Indirect bilirubin can go to the brain and uh, deposit within the brain. Okay, We don't like that at all. We want our water-soluble direct bilirubin. If we're missing our UDP transferase, we cannot make this transition. Our indirect bilirubin is going to be elevated. Okay, so let's go back to our Krigler in a jar. These patients are going to present early in life with jaundice, pernicterus, which is bilirubin deposition in the brain, and increased unconjugated bilirubin. How do we treat this? The only uh, good way we have is just to exchange the plasma of their blood, unfortunately. Okay, so we need to exchange the plasma out and get rid of all that indirect bilirubin. Uh, phototherapy is helpful. Phototherapy adds a charge to indirect bilirubin to make it less um, reactive. Okay, and so instead of indirect bilirubin reacting with the cells of our body and causing damage, uh, it's going to be reacting with uh, UV radiation. Okay, this does not conjugate it. Uh, some people will tell you that phototherapy conjugates indirect bilirubin to direct. That is not what happens. Okay, phototherapy just adds a little charge to make it a little bit less damaging to our body, okay? So, uh, type two quiddle jar is a little bit less severe and we can give phenobarb, which increases liver enzyme synthesis. Um, it's one of those things that increases the, the CYP450 system. And so phenobarb can be helpful there. Okay, so we've talked about two types of hereditary bilirubinemias, our go there and our quiddle jar. Both of these have to do with conjugation. Okay, so these are the upper part of this diagram. Now, once we've done conjugation, we can have problems with intracellular transport. And so our last one we're going to talk about is our Dubin-Johnson syndrome. In Dubin-Johnson, we have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. We were able to make it from indirect to direct. We made that transition just fine. Now we actually have uh, elevated levels of that direct bilirubin because we cannot transfer it into the bile canaliculi, okay? Once we have this conjugated bilirubin, we want to get it out of the cell and into the canaliculus. If it stays here in the cell, it's just going to um, cause a discoloration. We end up with a grossly black liver, and this is totally benign, okay? A rotor, same thing, um, and this is just uh, a little bit milder, no black liver here, okay? All right, so... Uh, you know, commit this diagram to memory. This helped me on my exam. Remembering Gilbert, number one, goes to number two, Kugel in a jar. This is our deadly one. This is our um, villain in the movie. Goes to Dubin Johnson, which is pretty benign. Just gives us a black liver. So what is jaundice? I've mentioned jaundice a few times throughout today's lecture and other lectures. What exactly is it? So jaundice is just simply a discoloration of the skin due to an increase in serum bilirubin, okay? And this is gonna be a disturbance of bilirubin metabolism, uh, some sort of obstruction preventing bilirubin from uh, getting from the common bile duct into the lumen of the duodenum, 
uh, an obstruction in the, um, the cystic ducts at the level of the uh, liver, uh, some sort of in, in our uh, Dubin Johnson, not allowing that, that bilirubin to leave the cells and enter the bile flow. Any of these things can cause uh, jaundice, okay? Uh, decreased amount of liver enzymes needed to process through um, uh, bilirubin can cause jaundice. So our patients with uh, cirrhosis can have jaundice. Any of these things that can that disrupt bilirubin metabolism can lead to jaundice. Okay, and we talked about this is just again talking about our bilirubin metabolism. We're not going to go through it again, uh, but it's there for your. Um, help. This is a diagram from our or a chart, I should say, from our pathoma. All of our different ways of developing uh, jaundice. So our extravascular hemolysis, ineffective hematopoiesis. Here we have high levels of unconjugated bilirubin overwhelming the conjugating ability of the liver. So we have the enzyme to conjugate, but there's too much indirect bilirubin. Okay. Uh, in extravascular hemolysis, what's happening is we have our red blood cells that are in the bloodstream and getting destroyed from some process. Malaria, um, you know, DIC, um, any, any sort of autoimmune destruction of our red blood cells. Anything that destroys red blood cells, um, TTP, right? All of these things destroy red blood cells. Uh, HUS, these things destroy red blood cells and they release uh, unconjugated bilirubin or indirect bilirubin into the bloodstream. Okay, so when you have an increased destruction of your red blood cells, sickle cell anemia, uh, that can lead to increased levels of indirect bilirubin. Okay, so here we're going to have dark urine um, and increased uh, risk for pigmented bilirubin gallstones. Okay. Our physiologic jaundice of the newborn, the newborn liver has transiently low UGT activity. Okay, and so that's something that we can see, and it's totally normal. We'll do a little phototherapy. Uh, phototherapy makes UCB water soluble. This is what I was saying before. We're not conjugating indirect bilirubin, but we are making it so that it's less damaging. It's now water soluble, okay, so we can urinate it out. Uh, Gilbert syndrome we talked about, Kruger and Ajar, Dubin Johnson, all causes of jaundice. We can have a biliary tract obstruction, okay, and so when we uh, think about, here's our gallbladder going to a cystic duct. We have our right hepatic duct, our left hepatic duct joining together. It joins with the cystic duct to form the common bile duct. That common bile duct will go to the ampulla. And here's our duodenum. And it will empty all of the bile into the duodenum to emulsify fats. Now, if we have an obstruction at a certain point, we can get indirect bilirubin, okay? Now, let me ask you, if we have an obstruction here in the neck of the uh, cystic duct, in the neck of the gallbladder, will we have jaundice, okay? Let me ask Toby, what do you think? If we have an obstruction here at the gallbladder, will our patient be jaundiced? This is a um, biliary colic, right, or cholecystitis. Will this cause jaundice? It should not, right? No. No. Good. And why is that? Okay, so jaundice, we said, is any time that we have uh, ineffective bilirubin metabolism. Basically, bilirubin cannot exit our body. When we have an obstruction here at the cystic, at the, at the cystic duct, these uh, right hepatic duct and left hepatic duct are still open. Common hepatic duct, still open. Common bile duct, still open. So any extra bilirubin we have in our body is still able to leave via the bile. That is all able to leave, okay? This is our liver here, right? Uh, so all of that extra bilirubin is still able to exit our body. Yes, everything that's stuck in here is still stuck in there, and that's a problem. That's a different kind of problem. But a patient with acute cholecystitis should not have jaundice. Their bile ducts, right, 
right and left hepatic, common hepatic, common bile duct are all still open. So they should not have jaundice. Okay, remember that. If you have a patient with acute cholecystitis that you think has acute cholecystitis, and then they're bright yellow glowing in the dark, they have something else going on, or at least two things going on, okay? Because those two do not go together. Now, if we progress a little bit further down and say we obstruct here, okay, now I don't think I have to ask you uh, before you tell me that this causes jaundice, why? The bilirubin that's entering the biliary tree is getting stopped at this level, okay? Now we're having kind of like a back pressure situation going on where all of the bilirubin is kind of getting backed up and back at the liver, back at the bile canaliculi, back to the hepatocytes. And now hepatocytes can't actually excrete any more bile or any more bilirubin, I should say, because there's just too much already there in the bile canaliculi. It's getting backed up. Now it's going to be backed up from inside the hepatocytes into the blood, right? Hepatocytes are not going to want to keep it, so they're going to be dumping it into the blood. We're going to be having backup of indirect bilirubin, okay? And so uh, this is our biliary tract obstruction. It's called obstructive jaundice. If you hear this term, obstructive jaundice, this means that either there's a stone in this common bile duct, there can be a cancer in the head of the pancreas blocking this whole area. You can have a cancer in the ducts of the uh, biliary tree. Uh, parasites, we talked about Clinorchis sinensis, Ascaris lumbricoides coming up into this biliary tree and causing blockage. Okay. So here, conjugated bilirubin will increase because our liver is still able to do its job. It can still conjugate bilirubin. It just can't excrete it into the bile like it likes to. Okay, so now it's going to be excreting it into the bloodstream. So we will have elevated conjugated bilirubin, direct bilirubin, okay, whichever term you like. Uh, decrease urine, urobilinogen. Again, in order to get urobilinogen, we need to be able to excrete it and then reabsorb it. Remember, there's bacteria here in the gut that do some conjugation that allow us to reabsorb it and excrete it through the kidneys, okay? So we should decrease urine, urine bilinogen. Increased alkphos, why? Because with an obstruction in the common bile duct, all of the cells lining the bile duct are becoming inflamed. So I wanna see elevated ALP, I wanna see elevated GGT. I wanna see both of those up, 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 okay? Why the cells lining that structure are becoming inflamed. Dark urine and pale stool. Uh, we will see some pruritus due to the increase in bile acids as well. When you see pruritus, that itchiness in the skin, that is actually not due to bilirubin. That's due to bile acids. Okay, that's one thing to remember. Because we have an obstruction, not only are we not excreting our bilirubin, we're also not excreting our bile. Okay, those two things are separate, and they're going to cause separate problems. Uh, we cannot get rid of our cholesterol, so we should see some xanthomas or yellow growths. Xanth means yellow, oma means growth. Uh, steatorrhea with malabsorption of fat soluble vitamins and here due to decreased bile and decreased uh, pancreatic enzymes, we're not absorbing our fat soluble vitamins. Okay. In viral hepatitis, uh, we have some inflammation disrupting the hepatocytes, small bile ductules. We'll see increases in conjugated and unconjugated, our direct and indirect bilirubin and uh, dark urine due to increased urine uh, bilirubin. So, different types of viral hepatitis we need to discuss. Um, the, these are all inflammation of the liver parenchyma. Hepatitis virus causes acute hepatitis, which may progress to chronic in some cases, depending on the cause, the viral cause. Uh, acute hepatitis presents as jaundice with dark urine uh, due to that conjugated bilirubin. Uh, fever, malaise, nausea, and elevated liver enzymes. Here we see an elevation of ALT greater than AST. Okay, we said with alcohol hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, we see a greater elevation of AST compared to ALT. In uh, viral hepatitis, it's an increase in ALT more than AST. Okay. So we'll see some apoptosis of our hepatocytes, um, and some symptoms last usually less than six months. If it does progress to a chronic hepatitis, here we're talking more symptoms lasting greater than six months. And this inflammation is predominantly going to affect that portal tract, and we do have that risk of progression to cirrhosis. Okay, so we can see some of the things that we see on our uh, biopsy. 
is something called a councilman body, which are these round looking cells here with the arrow. It's kind of hard to see me writing, I know. But these round looking areas here are councilman bodies. There's another one over here. Uh, Kupfer cell hyperplasia. Kupfer cells are the macrophages of our uh, portals, of our uh, sinusoids, excuse me. And so Cooper, if you have a viral infection, you should see increase uh, the number of macrophages, right? Uh, pi portal tri trioiditis, triaditis, so inflammation around the portal triad, and lobular disarray. Normally we have that really nice hexagon shape to our uh, hepatic lobules, and you can see in this image, it's really hard to try and see a, a hexagonal uh, lobule here, right, because of that inflammation. Our causes uh, for hepatitis, we have hepatitis A and hepatitis E, and these two we kind of group together because they are both transmitted fecal oral. All the rest of them are not going to be fecal oral, just hepatitis A and hepatitis E. Hep A is sort of our traveler's hepatitis with an acute presentation, a lot of vomiting, abdominal pain, nausea, that tends to pass after a short period. Uh, HEV is commonly acquired from contaminated water or undercooked seafood. Okay? These are not going to have a chronic state. We're going to have an acute uh, you know, a pain with palpation of that right upper quadrant, you know, abdominal, generalized abdominal pain, nausea, loss of appetite, vomiting, diarrhea. All of these things can be seen with hepatitis. Okay? Anti-IgM marks the acute infection. IgG would be protective, okay, would be protective. The one thing we need to worry about with HEV is its presence in pregnant women because if, you're, if the woman is pregnant, you know, pregnant women have a decreased uh, immune system, right? Their uh, immune system kind of takes a hit to prevent it from attacking the growing fetus. And so if you have this HEV infection in pregnant women, we worry about fulminant hepatitis, which is a liver failure massive liver necrosis, uh, this can actually be a deadly condition, okay? So hepatitis E, I really want you to make this association with pregnant women. Hep B virus, here we have parenteral transmission. I'm talking childbirth, intercourse, IV drug use, okay? Uh, this results in acute hepatitis in most cases. So 80% of the time, it's just gonna be an acute hepatitis that your body clears and you'll have some IgGs to tell the story. Um, but in, in some cases, we can progress to a chronic disease that can actually progress to cancer. Okay, so that's about 20% of cases. But remember, Hep B, usually acute. Hep B is usually acute. Hep B, usually acute. Hep C, uh, this is, I want you to associate with any kind of needles. So IV drug use, needle stick injuries, tattoos. Um, although it can be transmitted through unprotective intercourse, the rates are much lower than something like hepatitis B. Uh, hepatitis C um, is really transmitted through needle sticks. Okay? Uh, it used to be there's a risk from transfusion, but nowadays we screen for that, so we're not worried about that. Uh, here we have an acute hepatitis and a chronic disease in most cases. Chronic disease in most cases. So hepatitis B, usually acute. Hepatitis C, C stands for chronic. We're usually going to end up with a chronic uh, hepatitis. Okay, and so we can test for this looking for HCV RNA. Okay, and sort of follow those RNA levels to uh, look for chronic disease. All right, now before you started working in the hospital or you had to go to school, you probably had to get a hepatitis B vaccination. I know I did. You end up having to get it renewed you know, at regular intervals throughout your life, okay? But I have never gotten a hepatitis C vaccine. And my guess is neither of you have ever gotten a hepatitis B vac a C vaccine. And the reason for that is because hepatitis C has a, a very uh, specific virulence factor where it changes its capsid a lot. It changes how it looks. So if this is the capsid of your hep C um, viro viroid, if this is the infectious virus itself, these little bits of the outside of the capsule change so frequently that even our own body cannot uh, sufficiently uh, mount an immunological defense of it. This is why it ends up going into chronic disease because our body will synthesize a bunch of really great IgMs that target it perfectly. Those I IgMs will go on to become IgGs that target it perfectly. 
by the time we've made IgGs, the hep C that's already in our body has changed what it looks like. Okay, and now our IgGs are not going to work against it. Now we have to mount a new, uh, a new um, IgM response to that. Those IgMs are going to become IgGs. And guess what? Now those IgGs are not working against that same virus again. Okay, and so because it has this ability to mutate and change its appearance, we cannot uh, develop a vaccine for this. Okay, and the other thing is, if we went into our patient's blood, if we did some lab work, and we looked for hepatitis C IgGs or hepatitis C IgM, and we said, oh, you have IgG against hepatitis C. Okay, so you've had hepatitis C before, so I'm assuming that you're uh, protected against it. No, no, no. If you have IgMs or IgGs against hepatitis C, they do not indicate protection against hepatitis C for those reasons that I just described. Just because you have IgGs against hepatitis C does not mean that you have any level of protection against it. Okay? All right, so that's an important thing to know about hepatitis C, that it tends to go to chronic disease. All right. Hepatitis D uh, requires hepatitis B for infection. If you have a super infection, this means that you had hepatitis B active, and uh, after getting your hepatitis B, you somehow acquired hepatitis D on top of that. That's a super infection, and that can be quite severe uh, compared to if you had a patient with a hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection at the same time. Okay. Okay, great. Great, great, great. Okay, so let's talk about our hepatitis B serum markers. You know you're going to get questions on this. So we have, uh, let's see, about four different markers that we need to look for. Um, and so let's talk about those different markers. So HBS antigen is a surface antigen. This marks the active infection. And if we think about this, it kind of makes sense. If, you're, if there's a virus in your body that's actively multiplying and actively making progeny, it should be releasing a lot of those surface uh, proteins into the bloodstream, okay? And so a surface antigen peaks during active infection, okay? This patient's gonna be symptomatic. HBE envelope signifies infectivity or viral replication, okay? And so uh, the envelope is part of this viral uh, progeny, okay? And so if the envelope is active in the bloodstream, that's telling you that this patient can go on to infect other people, okay? So I'd, what I'd like you to memorize the, uh, the fact that envelope antigens signify infectivity. Okay, great. Now, getting into our own defenses against uh, hepatitis B, we have an IgM anti-core antibody. And this is an antibody that our body is making against a certain part of that hepatitis B capsule. Okay, and so if we see that, um, then we know our body is starting to mount a defense against this infection. Anti-HBE is another antibody that our body can make, which is against this envelope antigen. And these can be seen during the window period, but they're not specific for hepatitis. Okay, so um, we will be checking for this during the acute symptomatic phase. Okay, so if you see hepatitis uh, uh, hepatitis envelope antigen, this means the patient is infectious, okay? If we see an IgG against surface antigen, this tells us that our patient has resolved, has recovered, okay? Our patient was able to get through that IgM and get to IgG and was able to sufficiently kill off their uh, infection with hepatitis B, okay? If you do not see IgG against surface antigen, your patient is not protected against hepatitis B. Okay, this is really, I think, the bread and butter of what you need to know is that IgG against surface antigen denotes protection against hepatitis B. Okay, that's the most important thing to know. All right, when we talk about window period, this is the time between the appearance of the surface antigen and the appearance of anti-surface antibodies. Okay. Great. Okay, so getting into our liver failure and the uh, talking about cirrhosis. Uh, this is end-stage liver damage. 
with destruction of normal hepatic parenchyma with bands of fibrosis, regenerative nodules. We're gonna look at how that looks in a minute. Uh, fibrosis is mediated by those stellate cells that we saw when we looked at a diagram of a sinusoid. Uh, these lie beneath the endothelial cells that line those sinusoids, okay? And so how do these patients present? They're gonna have portal tension, which leads to those ascites, fluid in the peritoneal cavity, uh, splenomegaly, hypersplenism, where we can palpate the left upper quadrant and feel just a really swollen spleen when we take, tell our patients to take a deep breath. Uh, we're going to start seeing some of our peru, which are our uh, portosystemic shunts, all of our varices, so our esophageal, rectal, and umbilical uh, varices, uh, hemorrhoids, caput medusae, right? Because we're not able to detoxify the blood and get rid of all the ammonia and all of these toxic factors, we're going to start seeing mental status changes. Asterixis, which is sort of uh, this tremors in our hands, and eventually this can lead to coma. Uh, we will see gynecomastia. Why do we see gynecomastia in spider angiomata? Due to estrogen. Okay, polymer erythema due to hyperestrogenism. So when we have too much estrogen in the bloodstream, it leads to some of these problems. Okay? We'll also see jaundice because we're unable to get rid of all the bilirubin out of our bloodstream. Uh, decreased protein synthesis is going to lead to hypoalbuminemia, with edema, uh, coagulopathy due to decreased synthesis of clotting factors and we can follow uh, the PT to sort of see how severe that's becoming. Alrighty. So here is from the first aid, sort of describing all of the, all of the different presentations that we can see uh, with our patient with severe cirrhosis. Okay, and one thing we didn't mention, we can also have this testicular at atrophy, gynecomastia, amenorrhea in females. Uh, peripheral edema, cardiomyopathy. Alrighty. All right. And this is sort of talking about how we get our portal uh, systemic volume increased in our ascites, uh, kind of describing that whole process. I'm not going to go through that right now. We're going to move on to biliary, primary biliary cirrhosis. This is an autoimmune disease where we have a granulomatous, we're going to see granulomas, destruction of intrahepatic bile ducts. Uh, we're looking for, this is autoimmune, so we should see it in women and usually young women. So around 40 years is where this is going to start to present. It is associated with other autoimmune diseases. We can look for Graves' disease with this or Hashimoto's or uh, you know, any of the other um, antiphospholipid syndrome, any of the other autoimmune diseases we can look for. And uh, anti-mitochondrial antibody will be present in this disease. Okay, Anti-mitochondrial antibody. Uh, this is going to present with features of obstructive jaundice. Why? Because we've, we're destroying the bile ducts. Okay, so it's the same thing. Uh, when we saw the uh, obstructive jaundice, just drawing out our tree here. Okay, going to our common hepatic duct. Common hepatic duct. Right. We talked about how you can have an obstruction down here, which is going to cause accumulation of, you know, pressure and and all of our um, bilirubin upstream. Having a destruction of our bile ducts is essentially like having a complete obstruction at this point. Okay, so an obstruction down here, obstruction up here, they're both going to end up leading to elevated bilirubin. Okay, elevated bilies in our bloodstream. Okay, so we can see that jaundice, and a late complication will be cirrhosis. Now, there's another disease that really kind of sounds like primary biliary cirrhosis but I really want you to make sure you don't get confused with it. So primary sclerosing cholangitis, this is the disease that we associated with what? What inflammatory bowel disease is associated with this? Colitis ulcerosa. Good, ulcerative colitis is associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis. Okay, those two go together. We see inflammation and fibrosis of intrahepatic and, and extrahepatic bile ducts. And we're gonna see this periductal fibrosis with an onion skin appearance, okay, where we have a duct here, but it kind of has layers of ducts on the outside due to all the fibrosis. Uninvolved regions are going to be dilated. So the involved regions with this onion skin is going to be essentially stenosed, okay? And then the regions in between are going to become very dilated. So and when we do our ERCP, what we're gonna see is a beaded appearance. 
Again, we said it's associated with ulcerative colitis, and we can look for a P. anca in this particular condition. Okay, P. anca. Uh, it's going to present with obstructive jaundice, cirrhosis as a late complication, and increases our risk of cholangiocarcinoma. Okay, and so with primary sclerosis and cholangitis, this is UC, this is our onion skinning, our beaded appearance, all of these words are going to be used on your question stems. With primary biliary cirrhosis, the way that I always remember this, so you have your anti anti-mitochondrial antibodies, they usually write it as anti-MI. I always write it as my B, you know, right? Like say my bad, you say my B, and that B is your biliary cirrhosis, okay? So primary biliary cirrhosis, that's your anti-mitochondrial antibody. This is a young woman. This is a destruction of bile ducts giving you obstructive jaundice. Primary sclerosis and cholangitis, it's gonna be a man, a little bit older, um, you know, a lot of bloody diarrhea because of the UC, of course, and then having that P. anca is typical, okay? So really sort of be able to describe these and how they're different from one another as you're reviewing this topic. Okay, so questions we will go through together. Uh, when we meet next time, we'll probably do about five or six of these. I would encourage you all to do all of them in between now and the next time we meet, which I believe is Thursday. Uh, go through all these questions. And um, you know if you struggle with any of them, uh, those will be the ones that we go over together. Okie dokie. Any questions before we end today? Um, sorry, one or two. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, about the jaundice. Yes. Don't you uh, classify uh, according with the area where it's affected, if it is pre-hepatic, hepatic, or post-hepatic? Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's that's another good way to, uh, to describe the jaundice. Um, I think in terms of, uh, of how you need to know it for the exam, the most important thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's important, right? Um, the most important thing is to understand sort of what each elevation would mean. Uh, what do I mean by that? So if you had, um, when we have our breakdown of red blood cells, red blood cells into our hemoglobin, into our indirect bile, into our direct bile, okay? And that direct bile is gonna leave through the GI tract. So depending on what's elevated in this whole process, we'll tell you where, whether it's prehepatic, posthepatic, or intrahepatic, right? Because an obstruction um, between, say, the liver and the GI tract would lead to elevations in your direct bile and your indirect bile, right? If you had um, some sort of problem in the liver itself, Rather than having an increase in your direct bile, you would have just an increase in your indirect bile. Okay. Same thing is if your liver stopped functioning altogether, then you would have zero direct bile and you would only have indirect bile. Okay. And so, uh, you know, when you get these questions, they're going to give you levels of of bile. And typically, the way they'll do it, and I meant to mention this before, is what they're going to do is they're going to give you total bile, and then they're going to give you direct bile. That's it. They don't tell you what the indirect billy is. So they'll give you, say, a total billy of two. That's pretty high, right? They'll say a total billy of two, and then they'll give you a direct billy of 0 0.3. Okay. So when you have a total billy of two and a direct billy of three, would we be thinking about a post hepatic problem here? Probably not. Why? Because the difference between our total billy and direct billy is 1.7. 1.7 is our indirect bilirubin, right? That's how you're going to have to figure this out on the questions. And I should have mentioned that earlier, but uh, you're going to have to subtract from your total bile what your direct bile is in order to find out your indirect bile, okay? And if your indirect bile is so much higher than your direct bile, then you're going to know that this is a problem, say, at the liver, where we're not conjugating enough bilirubin. Is this a problem with our UDP glucuronosyl transferase, right? Do we not have sufficient levels? A congenital problem. Uh, do we have a cirrhosis here where um, our entire liver is failing and we can't conjugate bilirubin at all, okay? Or if, say, we had some uh, uh, pre-hepatic problem where we have a extravascular hemolysis, right? With an extravascular hemolysis, we're elevating our levels of hemoglobin. We're elevating our levels of indirect bilirubin. And because our liver is still working, we're also going to have elevated levels of direct bilirubin. 
So in that case, we would expect to see a T billy of maybe 4, 4.0, a direct billy of also elevated, say of 2. Okay. So in this case, because our liver is still working and it's still processing through bilirubin, we're still going to see an elevation in that direct bilirubin. However, we'll also see an elevation in the total bilirubin because we still have a lot of indirect bilirubin floating around. Okay. All right. Does that does that answer the question a little bit? Maybe not. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yeah. You're welcome. And we'll talk. There's there's some pretty uh, pretty good questions about it at the end of this packet, and so we'll talk through those next time. Okay. Okay. Great. So I will see you all on Thursday. Um, Toby, I will be emailing out this uh, video to you um, probably later today, um, this evening at the latest. Um, I, I just basically have to wait for it to upload, okay? Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Great. Right. I will see you all on Thursday. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.